So I took, I took you through uh, six illusions. Thought, self, knowledge, time, control, and fear. Um, as, we, as, we, as we discussed, if you, if you go through those illusions, if you cease through them, you go out of that state of confusion where everything seems blurry and doesn't work really well, and you go into a state where you can start to compare the world to what it really is. But when you compare the world to what it really is, you get faced with your, um, I wouldn't say worst enemy, but your worst tool. Uh, your brain has defects. OK? Um, they're not really defects. They are features, if you want. So think about it this way. Uh, uh, the, 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 the defects are as follows. Your, your brain will filter, assume, recall, predict, feel, label, and exaggerate all the time. <coughs> like literally all the time. OK? It thinks it's doing well by doing that. Can you, can you, can you take a look at those and tell me if they sound familiar? Fil filtering, assuming, right? We'll, we'll go through some of them uh, in, you know, as examples. But because of those seven defects, your perceptions of the world, your perceptions of the real events, your perceptions of what your expectations should be, OK? are actually very distorted most of the time. I may actually, I may dare say that your brain has never told you the truth, ever, okay? Prove it, Mo, I will, right? But it has another interesting tendency on top of the seven defects. It tends to have an overarching tendency to be grumpy, okay? It's just seriously grumpy. My, mine is getting a little more fun now, right? But it's always been grumpy. Always looks at the world and says, horrible, don't like it, unhappy about this, unhappy about that. Let's think about how those features, uh, uh, we'll come back to the tendencies in a minute, but let's think about how all of this developed, okay? Go back to the cave years, you know, the hunters are going out there, you know, this is where the brain was developing. Uh, there is a sound coming from the bush behind. The, the, the hunter starts to, you know, narrow down. They, they, you know, they stay quiet. They filter. They're trying to listen to every noise, right? They're really, really looking, you know, acutely at that bush, trying to see what's going on there. The lead hunter, the boss, would say, it's a tiger. From the height of the, of the leaves that moved, clearly this is a tiger. And because now it's stopped moving, it's now stopping the noise, I'm assuming hmm, that it knows that, we're here, that we are here. Okay? And it goes on. It goes on saying, oh, I am afraid. You know, I have seen Timmy being eaten by a tiger before. It wasn't a pleasant experience. You know, I recall that memory. This is not the kind of memory I want. Right? Then it exaggerates. It starts to say, hey, and by the way, that's not one tiger. It's a, you know, a, 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 a mean tiger, you know, two of them hunting together, and we might as well just run, right? As, you know, as, as it basically realizes that it was a couple of birds on the bush that are flying away, right? Those are very, very useful features when you're in the caveman years, right? It's like it's okay to be afraid of a, of a couple of birds on a bush, but stay safe, okay? Much, much better than being, you know, okay with the couple of, uh, 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 with the noise, but it turns out to be a real tiger, okay? As you move into the real world, as we said before, those tendencies, those features turn into defects, okay? So the filtering allows people like us sitting in sunny California, in Stanford University, uh, you know, where the donuts were maybe a little too sweet today to, I'm, I'm just making this up, to complain and, say, and say the donuts were a bit too sweet and we didn't have crow donuts or whatever they call them. Cronuts, yeah, right? And, you know, there is, because you're filtering out the rest of the world. You're filtering out, 
you know, how miserable it could actually be. You're, you're filtering out those in Africa that have never, ever, ever seen a donut, right? That, that don't even have the clean water. That you're filtering out the rest of the story, and so your narrow view of the story can actually sound reasonably depressive. Donuts, I mean, we, in Dubai we have, uh, uh, you know, video or images going around uh, Dubai Chronicles or something like that of, you know, oh my God, my, uh, my visa is going to expire in six months. You know, life is very unfair. Or, oh my God, you know, uh, the, you know I had to go up uh, three flights of stairs because the elevator was not working. You know, my life is miserable. And, and so, you know, when you filter things out, you end up, um, uh, you know, those features of filtering this out, things out or whatever other defects in your brain become very, um, uh, bec they, they work against you in the modern world. Okay, uh, this was my first car. I've, uh, uh, you know, actually ha I, ha I installed a, an onboard computer on that Fiat back in the 80s, which was like super futuristic at the time. I always loved cars. And that car had huge issues. It's like my dad got me a car. It wasn't a budget, so it wasn't the greatest car ever. And uh, it had two types of issues, okay? One type is it wasn't working. Really, I mean, that's a big issue. You know, the radiator was leaking, the spark plugs were dirty, you know, the battery was dead, and the, you know, the starter didn't really, the starter engine had a pro, you know, the motor had a problem. So to start the car was constantly a problem, okay? It always had defects that didn't make it function. But when it functioned, it always went to the left. For some reason, that car constantly had a very fond relationship with going to the left, right? It has, had wheel balancing issues and, you know, tire, I don't know, whatever, stability issues or whatever, and it just always went to the left. So regardless of the defects it had, always going left. So we'll call those defects and we'll call those biases, okay? Let's talk about the biases, the overarching tendency to be grumpy. We discussed very quickly that your brain's job is to keep you safe, right? Imagine if the conversation happening in the caveman's brain was like, hmm, what's that smell of urine? Oh, it's nothing. It must be a tiger that was passing here, but he's probably now by the river. You know, it's nicer by the river. That's what tigers do. There is no tiger here, by the way. And you know what? It must have been very pleasant for Timmy to be eaten. It's okay, man, just walk into the jungle, no problem. That's not what your brain wants you to do. Your brain wants, to, wants you to think that a tiger is a, is a threat, we might as well uh, not, um, you know, not go to the, to the tiger. So let's test your brains for this, okay? This, this, ex this uh, practice uh, exercise is gonna take two seconds, okay? So I want you to keep your eyes on the screen and in two seconds, tell me what's going to happen. What's, what is in, what's happening in the picture that's going to, that you're going to see? Okay, what's happening? The, the girl's going to get run, get run over, sorry? Yeah, so, so the, the car is speeding on its way, the little boy is running away, and the girl is not paying attention, so the girl's gonna be run over. Right? Did you notice the uh, little handbook falling out of the girl's bag? No. Did you notice the teddy bear in her hand? No. Did you notice the uh, brand of the car? No. Did you notice the parking meter behind the car? No. Right? None of that is important because the way your brain looks at things, it says, problem. Where's the problem in this picture? Okay, the problem in this picture is the girl is gonna get run over. You understand that? Right, but that's the full picture. Right, very, very often when you're not seeing the full picture, your interpretation of what's going on is very different than what really is going on. This car is parked, he didn't put money in the meter, he's gonna pay a parking ticket, and the boys are just having fun. The girl is perfectly safe because there is a stop person, a stop sign, right? Now, I call that ex exercise check, right? Uh, check is our, our brain, you know, to, to, un to understand that your brain is constantly trying to look for what's wrong. So I want you to take a minute, okay, to track. Be honest with yourself, right? Think of all of the thoughts that came to your brain within the last few days or the last week or whatever, 
and try to answer that one simple question. You don't have to be super accurate in terms of like 57.4% of the time it behaves this way and the other time it behaves the other way, right? You're just trying to say, to ask yourself about your own brain, how often, okay, is it more, does, does your brain more likely than not, more often than not, spot out what's going right or what's, what's going wrong for you? One minute, okay? You wanna ask yourself, my personal brain, is it optimistic? Does it tell me what's going well? Or is it pessimistic? Does it tell me what's not going well? It doesn't take a full minute, does it? We don't need a minute, okay. Who has a grumpy brain? Oh man, okay. Who's lying? The others, all right. Uh, <laughs> okay, the majority is most of our brains are grumpy. Now I'll, I'll give you another test. Hmm? Um, now I'm trying to, to frame you here. I'm trying to set you up to believe that your brain is grumpy. It only looks at the bad side of things, okay? I'm gonna ask you a question and I'm gonna ask you to, 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 to tell me what's going to happen, right? Try, please try not to be grumpy, okay? There you go. So you have one minute each uh, to talk to each other about what, uh, what do you think will happen to our world as a result of global warming? Go ahead. You have two minutes to chat. <laughs> right, Any, anyone found anything positive about global warming? Did, you, did we talk about the ice caps melting? Did we talk about the you know, polar bear being extinct? Did, did we talk about countries being flooded? Anything positive? Yes. What? Give me examples. <laughs> Solutions. Okay, working together, creating technologies that are clean. People in the Arctic will be able to go to the beach, and people may be able to go to uh, to, sn to ski in California, right? So, I mean, like right here in Palo Alto or wherever we are. Uh, okay. But, but um, okay, let me, let me ask the question more generally. Please go ahead. What, what, what was the positive? Um, we've had the planet for quite some time, so global warming is going to speed up the arrival of the apocalypse, and that'll be <laughs> nice. We're done. Okay. That's uh, an interesting positive view. All right. Speed up the uh, apocalypse. So, uh, so let me read this for you. Uh, uh, Professor Richard Toll of Sussex University uh, reviewed 14 studies of the effects of climate change and con con concluded that the change up to three uh, uh, degrees uh, centigrade uh, from pre-industrial levels would actually be beneficial. Okay, uh, around uh, only about 0.8 degrees have happened so far in the last 150 years, which, which suggests that the actual negative impacts of global warming will start happening by the year 2080. Uh, um, he goes on to say that the economic output, the, 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 the climate change has improved human welfare in the past century by increasing global uh, economic output by as much as 1.4%, uh, and that the figure may rise to 1.5% by 2025. For people, that means the difference between survival and starvation. He suggests that the chief benefits of global warming include lower energy cost, it includes uh, fewer droughts, richer biodiversity, and fewer winter-related deaths. Winter-related deaths are actually some of the, 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 the highest causes of deaths in some uh, places around the world. Uh, it also, the greatest benefit is from carbon dioxide itself, okay? Uh, bringing raw material, uh, w w being the raw material from which plants make carbohydrates, uh, and thus most of our food chain, the increase in the average dio bi uh, di carbon dioxide levels from 0.03% uh, uh, to 0.04% of the air in the past century had a measurable impact on the agricultural yields, okay? And, and, and plant growth, and accordingly, it is what is feeding our seven billion people planet, okay? Now, none of that, I'm not an advocate to keep global warming going, right? But most of that is actually true. In the short term, we needed more CO2 to create more food, to create the, you know, the, the the, to, to be able to feed our planet. Interestingly, CO2 is a very, very rare resource in the, in, in the atmosphere, right? Uh, in, in an interesting way, uh, global warming might lead to shifts. It might lead to, uh, you know, 
um, um, uh, population shifts and so on, but it is leading to the world trying to find cleaner ways to create energy, right? Uh, there are benefits to a topic that we absolutely could not spot. Do you, do you realize what I'm trying to tell you here, okay? Even though I was daring you to find what's good about something, your brain is unable to find what's good about it. Okay? Your brain is unable to try and say there must be something, there must be a half full in the glass. Okay? That tendency to be grumpy is really what, uh, what makes our, uh, our brains most of the time not tell us the truth. Because by the way, what Professor Toll said here is part of the truth. It's not the whole truth, there are disasters to global warming that is also part of the truth. But the whole truth, the definition of the truth is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Right? So our brains are unable to tell us that. Let's talk about the, uh, the defects. I'm not covering all of the defects. Uh, uh, here is an exercise. It's 10 seconds, so please focus on the screen. Read the sentence that will appear on the screen. Right? That's filtering in action. Have you, have you read it? So your brain just filtered out the word da. Every time it was written twice, your brain just completely filtered it out. Have you seen that? OK. So we filter everything. There is so much happening in this room that our brains, being a single processor with a limited resource, filters out everything. It just zooms in. Go ahead. Did you find it? Yeah, three times or twice. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, right. Uh, it, we filter out everything. It, it's twice on every line, three times in a row, right? Uh, so, so, so our brains, being a massive computer as they are, they're limited in resources. They would filter out most of what's around them to focus on what they think matters. But as they, fi as they filter out what they think doesn't matter, what matters to them? What matters to them is to be grumpy. So they focus in, they zoom in on what makes them grumpy, right? And they forget, as I, as I always use the example of the little black dot on the forehead, they forget all of the beauty that's surrounding that little uh, black dot, okay? Here is another example. Uh, in 10 seconds, tell me, this is uh, Cara Delevingne. Uh, describe her in 10 seconds, shout. shout. Say? Beautiful. Hmm? Say? Blue eyed? Blonde? Barbary? Single. <laughs> okay? Uh, so, what if I showed you this picture? It's the same person? Okay? Have you seen that one before? So, she, she's actually quite. Um, open in terms of how she, d she doesn't believe a supermodel has to always look that way, okay? Uh, but if I had showed you this before, you would have labeled it very differently, right? This is labeling in action. We label things, okay? So you said blue eyes, by the way, that's actually not labeling. Bl blue eyes is a, is a description. The way you should have described this picture is a, blue, a, a, a blonde woman with blue eyes pausing for a picture with a lot of makeup. Okay? That's not lo labeling, right? Labeling are things that are, boom, snap action, snap judgments, stunning, beautiful, uh, you know, um, uh, whatever. I, you, we, we've had quite a few of those, like supermodel, right? Uh, seductive, whatever. You make a snap judgment. Again, because of the limited resources, compute power that your brain has, it has to abstract concepts into small snap judgments. Okay? That allows it to take quick actions. It, it cannot process all of the information all the time, so it labels things. It labels them in the form of judgment. Okay? In the form of judgment that basically is blue eyes, blonde hair, uh, you know, a seductive look, a pretty paintbrushed photograph, means stunning. I don't need to think about that every time I see it, every time I'm going to see it, I'm going to label it that way. And accordingly, I can save a few microseconds of processing power, and I can go on to do what matters and see what I'm going to do about that. OK, one more exercise. 
Uh, this one is also 10 seconds. Please read the sentence that will appear on the screen. Can you read it? Of course, right? It's not that difficult. This is assuming inaction, right? Your brain, by filtering out some information, realizes most of the time that it doesn't have enough information to make decisions. So what does it do? It assumes what's missing. Okay? By assuming what's missing, what is it doing? It's not telling you the truth. It's telling you what it thinks the truth is. Very, very big difference between the truth. So if you were to read this sentence as the truth, you would say N-T-H-R-D-F-R. That's how you read that sentence, okay? By assuming the missing letters in there, you've just added a ton of information to something that doesn't exist, okay? In that simple uh, you know, example, you happen to be correct because it's a simple example, but when it comes to that last fight between you and your girlfriend, the information is a lot more complex, okay? It's assuming things that may not have necessarily happened. Oh, she looked at me that way. Oh, she said this. Oh, he said that, right? None of it is true. Now, I, I won't go through all of the seven examples. It's been a very long day for, day for you, but you can really go through them. It's, very, it's not that difficult to understand that your brain is constantly uh, uh, morphing the truth. But here is what I find incredible, okay? Our brains are so trained to use those seven features that it, they are so sticky that even when I tell you that something is missing, you still continue to believe in the illusion that your brain tells you. Here is an example, again, from assumptions. Okay? Tell me which is darker in color, the square that has the letter A on it or the square that has the letter B on it. Which is darker? A is, is darker, right? So clearly A is a darker color than B, isn't that true? Okay, I'm going to now blur out the rest of the squares and show you the truth. Okay, they're both exactly the same color. Right? Both exactly the same color, but your brain decides in an assumption format from the checkboard, checkboard pattern that A should be equal to B. Okay? A and B are the same color because the shade of the cylinder actually makes A and B the same color. So B is lighter on the checkboard. Right? But it is uh, darker because of the shade of the cylinder. Now I'm going to put this, the original image back up. Now you're supposed to see that A, is, A and B are the same color, aren't you? You now know the truth. There you go. Okay? Your brain refuses to accept the truth. It's incredible, really. Look at that. Can you see this? It's incredible. They are so sticky, uh, you know, the stickiness of those defects. They are so hard to see through because your brain will continue to behave the same way. It will continue to filter. It will continue to assume. It will continue to include emotions and feelings into its judgment. It will continue to label. It will include memories as truth, okay? And it will exaggerate way out of proportion all the time. It's that sticky, okay? So... What do you do about that? When you have a brain that is filtering, assuming, recalling, recalling is when it brings memories as part of the truth, okay? Predicting, when it takes the future as part of the truth, while it has no idea what's going to happen in the future. Labels, labeling, those snap judgments, uh, take that part of the truth. When it includes emotions as part of the truth and when it exaggerates, plus has a tendency to always be grumpy, is a brain that has never told you the truth. It has never told you the truth. Okay, in Soul for Happy, I talk about details about how you can really work through filtering specifically or assuming specifically and so on, but it, we don't have the time for this today and it doesn't really matter, okay? What matters is because you're not told the truth, the way you see the events as, and, and, and the way you, ha you build expectations are totally blurry and distorted. Okay? So you look at an event and you say, this is horrible, right? Like I'm in Stanford having a nice lecture, eating donuts, and it's horrible, right? Why? Because your brain is filtering things out and making assumptions and doing certain things that is really not the truth. You know, 
You get a car, and the car is beautiful, but it doesn't have leather seats, and your expectations are, oh, this is horrible. My car, you know, the only car that you have doesn't have leather seats, you know, this is horrible. Right? I'm, I'm just making those things up. I mean, there are simpler examples, I'm just making examples up. Okay? If you see the li life through the brain defects, you're constantly unhappy. Events which are blurry and not true are compared to expectations that are blurry and not true, and you're constantly unhappy. So what do you do about that? Okay? As I said, there are techniques to manage every one of them, simple, but there is an overarching technique. Uh, um, Byron Katie, in her magnificent book uh, called Loving What Is. It's a bit of a, 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 you know, a strong book, if you want, but it's truly magnificent. She uses uh, something that she calls the work, okay? to make people realize that life is what it is and that you should love life as it is. And, and her, her pillar in the, in, the, in the work is something that is called, is that true? Okay? Is that true is a simple technique to find the truth behind everything. Okay? Whatever your brain tells you, you can simply ask your brain and say, is that true? Okay? So I'm going to ask you to do a simple, is that true, uh, uh, exercise okay? by having, spending two minutes each okay, and telling each other uh, something like, uh, my teenage daughter is a pain in the neck. Okay? The other person should answer and say, is that true? Does she make your neck hurt? Okay? And then you would say, no, I didn't mean a pain in the neck. I mean, uh, you know, she's impossible to deal with. Is that true? But you've been dealing with her so far. It's not impossible. No, you know what I mean. She's always, always rude. Is that true? 24-7, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, she's always rude? Or does she give you breaks sometimes? Ah, oh, come on, you know what I mean. She shouldn't be rude anyway. Ah. Oh. Well, where have you been living? I mean, a teenage daughter, she's rude. That's how it is, right? You know, it's not true that she should not be rude, okay? So pick anything that's annoying you, talk to the person next to you, and try to ask the person next to you, help them out, okay? <laughs> right, so did you find this useful? Yeah? It's, it's really interesting, right? Most of what we do is either exaggerated or filtered or whatever, and it's rarely ever true, right? So let's chat. That was a quick section, and I told you it's going to get easier from the illusions onwards. Right. Anything you want to talk about, or should we zoom through? All right. Question. Um, oh, wait, 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 wait. It's not really a question, it's just a quick feedback. Um, because I'm realizing I'm losing the connection between what you started with yeah. and what, what is being covered now. So yeah, that's such a, you're absolutely right. There is so much content. I suddenly lost context of where we are going. OK, so I don't remember know there was 675, right? The reason, the reason why uh, we are mostly unhappy is because we have six grand illusions that blur our judgment. Okay? The six grand illusions are very, very deep, and they took us half of the day, more than half of the day. Right? The six grand illusions were thought, self, uh, time, uh, knowledge, time, control, and fear. Right? When you go above the six grand illusions, hmm, you are no longer below clarity of thought. You're, uh, you're in that stage where you're thinking incessantly. You're judging everything all the time. You look at things, you judge them, you say, my, the events met my expectations, I'm happy. The events did not meet my expectations, I'm unhappy. Right? The problem with the incessant thought stage and why we tend, end up being unhappy more than we end up being happy is that most of the events we compare to the expectations are blurred. They're not true. They are suffering from brain defects that get us to see, to see events not as they really are, but as we think they are through the lens of the defects and the grumpiness. Right? So, uh, so by, by looking at, uh, by, by seeing through the, si the six grand illusions, you're, in, you're, you're out of the state of confusion to toggling between happiness and suffering. By fixing your seven defects, mainly through the, ex uh, the technique of is that true, you really see the events as they really are, and hopefully you will hit happiness much more often than you hit suffering. Does that make sense? Other questions? Yes. Microphone. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I'm curious to hear your thoughts about um, oftentimes events that make you really, that annoy you, um, become like triggers for problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, so like, let's say Travis never hated the experience of taxis and, you know, getting a ride. Like, would he have created Uber, right? So I don't know, what, at what point do you realize like that's something that I can change versus like, oh, I should just forget about it. Interesting. Uh, so I, I keep going back to the same idea of committed acceptance, right? So, so there, is, uh, there is no link between taking the action and feeling annoyed about something. You don't need to feel unhappy to decide to make the action, to, 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 the, to take the action, right? You, you need to realize there is something wrong. That's okay, right? But what he did is he said, taxis are not great, I need to create something else, versus someone else that says, Taxis are not great. I'm going to, you know, dwindle and die, right? You know, taxis are not great. There will always be taxis. How do I live that way, right? So you don't, you, he, or somebody that says, taxis are not great. I'm going to dwindle and die until I create Uber, right? There is really no reason to, twind, to dwindle and die as a midpoint, as a stepping stone. You can simply say, okay, something's wrong. I'm going to take an action about it, but I have committed acceptance. I accept that it's wrong. If I can fix it, then I'll be happy. If I don't fix it, then I'll be happy. You understand the difference? So I'm committed. If I can do something about it, I'm happy. If I cannot do something about it, I'm still happy. Make sense? Action has no relationship to how you feel. Unhappiness is not a prerequisite for you to take action. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that I mean, you talk about black swans and butterfly effects, and the former is going to be happening occasionally. The other one is going to be happening almost all the time. So I'm assuming also like uh, there is this philosophy that pain is part of life. I think what you're trying to get at here is that um, sometimes pain is necessary to sort of inspire an action or solutions. But what we need, what we need to do is to actually mitigate that length of pain and re reframe the pain as something spot on. Okay. Because pain, like, you can't get rid of pain and suffering from life, right? I mean, it's pain, pain is part of life. I mean, that is realistic expectation. Realistic expectation is that we will get a little bit of pain through life, right? right. And as you get that pain, you don't need to turn it into suffering, right? You can turn it into action, which is to protect your finger when it comes to physical pain. Where, 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 or, or maybe calling your friend and saying sorry when you, when you have psychological pain, that's guilt that you said something bad to your friend. That's pain leading to an action, okay? But pain leading to suffering is to just think about it and make it worse and make it worse and make it worse. So pain will happen in life. But I have a philosophy about pain that is actually a bit interesting. I, I know this will sound a little idealistic, okay? All that life really wants is to be experienced, okay? Think of a seven-course meal. We were just talking about that. It has a bit of sweet and it has a bit of sour, sometimes a bit of bitter and sometimes a bit of savory, right? And sweet is not necessarily better than sour. They're just different flavors, right? The idea is can you experience those flavors and still enjoy the meal? By, as a matter of fact, would the meal be a meal without all those diversities of flavors, right? So pain happens, and it makes you appreciate the times when you don't have pain. It also makes you take action. It also makes you a better person. I'll come to that in the next section, okay? But, but it's not a bad thing. There is a very di big difference between good and bad, and between difficult and painful and whatever other things. It's not bad that taxi drivers are rude. It's not bad, it just is. You understand what that is? So, so in, in uh, Byron Katie's book, it, she, she calls it loving what is. Because life just is. It, this is what it is. It, it happens in a certain way, it is. And you have a choice. I, I use the example of the dentist, okay? You can go to the dentist and say, look, I have a horrible thing, it's gonna take a root canal, right? And the dentist would say, okay, I can, either, I can make you one of two offers. One offer is two hours of pain, and the other, the other offer is two hours of pain with an extended two weeks of pain afterwards. Okay? Which would you pick? You would pick the one with two hours of pain. Why would you want to extend the pain by two weeks? Right? But that's what we do when we're suffering. 
When we're suffering, we go like, okay, taxi driver was rude. I'm gonna extend that pain by recalling it in my head for the next two weeks and making myself suffer. You don't need any of that. Okay, one more. Sorry, can I just follow up on that one? So like, um, you keep bringing the example of the, the passing of Ali. So like, that was pain. Like, how did you yourself overcome that and then sort of turn that into action? So, so I, I think the, the eye-opening moment for me was, you know, being well-known and prominent in Dubai, uh, the news of Ali traveled really fast. So literally within an hour and a half, we got a call from the Minister of Health saying, you know, this investig investigation is not going to go, uh, you know, unnoticed. We're going to do something about it. And, you know, uh, we would ask to do an autopsy on Ali, right? And so I looked at Nibel and I said, um, my wife, and, and I said, hey, Nibel, would you want that, right? In, in our culture, uh, we, we, we prefer to bury our dead quickly, okay? We think that this, you know, again, you know, crazy beliefs, some of you may think, but we think that life is not the end, you know, death is not the end of life and there is another life, and so we, let's just get on with it so that they move on to the next level of the game, okay? And so I looked at Nibel and I said, Nibel, is that what you want? And she asked a very interesting question, one and a half hours into this. She said, will it bring Ali back? So we find the doctor guilty. We take him out of his career. Will it bring Ali back? Okay? So, of course, it would actually put disciplinary measures on, on the doctor, right? So that they pay more attention, that there are no more mistakes, and so on. But will it bring Ali back? And I think the anchor point for us was nothing is going to bring Ali back. Years of suffering are not going to bring Ali back. Okay? Whatever it is that we do is not, not going to bring Ali back. The only thing that maybe would bring a little bit of Ali back is that now you guys know about Ali. You understand this? So that's the right action. The right action is the only thing we can do is for me to have the opportunity to tell you how wonderful he was. Right? Nothing else would change it. So why would I take the root canal with an extended two weeks of pain? As Astro would tell me, if I had taken the two extra weeks of pain, would it have been a, you know, a sign that, Ali is, uh, that I love Ali more? Would it have been a sign that the event was not significant for me? No, the event was super significant. Uh, significant. I still cry. I miss him like crazy. I still cry. Okay? But I'm not suffering. There is a difference between missing him and feeling the pain of missing him. That's pain. Okay? or dwelling on it and creating suffering from it that will never change anything. There is a huge difference. We need to stop choosing to suffer because suffering is a choice. Simple as that. Silence. Oops. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the illusion of knowledge. We talked about values uh, being an illusion as well. Um, morality. I was wondering, are there universal values, I guess, that would span across time? I mean, one that comes to my mind is compassion. I'm wondering, is that an illusion as well? Yeah, so, so, so there are things. We're going to talk about what I call the truth now, okay? There are things that are true. I, you call it compassion, I call it love. I actually think love is real, okay? Uh, but there are things that are highly blurred. So I, I am a reasonably religious person, okay? But I will tell you, religion is highly modifi modified, okay? Uh, you know, it is not... You, you tend to believe in a value system, but that value system actually is an illusion of knowledge, okay? You tend to believe... Uh, uh, you know, you, you could use an example of patriotism is, it, it, you know, compels you to be okay with killing the other guy, right? It's a value, like I'm patriotic, the other guy is the enemy, that's okay, right? Is that the right knowledge? Absolutely not, okay? And even though it's a widely accepted knowledge, it's absolutely not true. So even values need to be revisited. Even values are highly, highly influenced by your upbringing, by your place in the world, by your ego. Highly inflated, values are highly inflated by ego. Okay? Religious extremists will believe that people who are not religious should burn in hell. 
Okay? That's an extreme ego position of, I'm right, you're wrong, you should burn in hell. Okay? That's horrible. Right? All of those um, illusions, uh, you know, all, all, everything, I think my, my whole message from the entire book is, everything needs to be revisited. And anything that makes you unhappy or makes you, you know, delusional should be revisited, it should be changed. You want? Um, Emily, can we have a mic? So I just want to keep uh, up a question about your Uber driver. Mm. So if the Uber driver really rude to you, I mean, as a human being, it naturally will feel angry. Of course. So I think I'm not sure the, the point you give us is more like the driver is rude is fine, or the driver is rude, we feel angry, but we're fine about we're angry, and we feel a way to kind of control it. So there are levels. We're now going to talk about joy, right? So, so, so. Feeling angry is a natural reaction. Your brain tells you this is a bad thing, you have a, a natural reaction. If you go around this f a few times in your life, you realize that anger has added nothing to you whatsoever other than make you suffer. It didn't change the driver in any way. And you start to tell yourself, Uber driver was rude. That's the simple fact. Anger is not going to change anything about it. There is nothing I can do about it. I'm okay with it. Honestly, if I stop the thinking now, I will move on with my life. The story will be over. Right? So, so while that takes practice and it takes a skill, hmm, the truth is, yeah, it's really not worth a single brain cycle from you that the Uber driver was rude. It's like, ah, done, yeah, passed. On the other hand, there will be things that need action, right? Like the hospital was not, uh, you know, was not, um, um, did not follow the right procedure. There needs to be certain procedures in place so that no more kids die, okay? Definitely action is required. Hmm? But, it, but, it, but that's a different thing. The action is the point, it's not the anger that's the point. You understand? 